All right, why don't we turn to Matthew together, and we're in a new section here in the book of Matthew. Uh, We have finished our study on the disciples, and now we are in the section where the disciples are instructed on how they're to do ministry. And I believe that this section will be impactful for you and for me uh, because the disciples are only 12 of them, uh, 12 core disciples of Jesus Christ, ministering to a broad group of people. And that is pretty much our state in Hollywood. If you think about our church, uh, we have a very, very small group of core people, very small. And every day we're getting visitors. I mean, every week, that is. We're getting visitors who come, people who we don't know. And, and what do we do? And how do we build new relationships? And, and sometimes people leave, and we don't know where they're going, and we never heard from them again. And so this is exactly what the disciples are going through. And so we're going to be reading about this here in Matthew chapter 10, verse 5 through 15, and really getting a glimpse of um, ministry in the Galilee region, I believe that's very similar to ministering here in Hollywood. So let's read uh, Matthew chapter 10, verse 5 through 15. And it says, These twelve Jesus sent out, instructing them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You receive without paying, give without pay. Acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belts, no bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or staff, For the laborer deserves his food. And whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it and stay there until you depart. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. If it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet. And when you leave that house or town, Truly I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. In order for us to be successful in doing what we're called to do, we must stay focused. I think about a particular incident I experienced when I was at work, and this is not something I personally experienced, but my friend did, and I have been relationship with my friend. I know him. I interact with him personally when I'm at work. And this friend was fired from his job. And the specific reason why this person was fired was for time card fraud. He had been filling out his time card saying he's worked so many hours, but he wasn't working. So when he was found out, he had to be let go. And this is the reason why companies don't really like their workers working remotely. Now, I work remotely. I telecommuted, and there was a privilege given to me, but I almost had to beg my boss to do it because my boss simply says, I don't want you to do this because if they ever find out that you are working, in the times that you say that you are working, they will come get you, and they will find out. They will audit you, and they will fire you. And they didn't want to lose me. And so they didn't want to give it to me, but I said, you know what, I would like to have it because I, you know, I was doing seminary and I was doing some work remotely. And so they said, okay, you can have it. And it was something that they reluctantly gave to me. For my friend, it was the same thing. He was given that. And he was actually someone who was higher in management than I was. He was high in management. He was smart. He was was, uh, a person who contributed much to the company. But it turned out that he was filling out his time card and he wasn't working in those specific times. And the reason why was because he was distracted. He was distracted from what he was supposed to do. And and he might be distracted from his family, distracted because of his kids, distracted because, because of his errands and different obligations, what he had, but he was distracted. As much as the company did not want to let him go, He had to go. That was company policy. He had to be fired. It was a sad day, a sad day for him and a sad day for the company. In the same way, in our lives, we can become distracted. We can be distracted from the things which we are supposed to do, 
for all kinds of reasons. If you're talking to someone, if you're thinking about something else, you're distracted. You didn't really hear what the other person's saying. We have all experienced that in our lives. You might be distracted from the work that you're doing because your kids came to you and you, instead of doing work, you're talking to your kids or helping your kids and you're distracted from the work. Or perhaps you're distracted when you're running and, and you're running this road and, and, and you didn't see the pothole that's in front of you and you step into that pothole because you're distracted. You, you weren't focused on the running which you are doing. And so we could be distracted because of various, various reasons. And if we're distracted from the very thing which we are supposed to do, that can have significant consequences in our lives. This is not just something physical. This is something spiritual as well. Because in the very story of our sin against God, it is a, it's a situation of distraction. It's a sin of distraction. You can think of Adam and Eve what they were supposed to do in the very beginning. Adam and Eve were to stay focused. Adam and Eve were to stay central to the purpose of God. The purpose of God which is given to them in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, which God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. This is God's purpose for Adam and Eve. Their very purpose is this, is that they will multiply and they will represent God's will in their lives. They would represent God and live for God and, and, and they, they would be this emissary of, of God to show the world the glory of God through them, that is the purpose of Adam and Eve. And God provides for them faithfully. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 29, it says, And God says, Behold, I've given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. God says, i provided for you. I've given you a purpose, and i also given you provision. So do it. Live your life out as I have called you to live. This lasted about, I don't know, a very short period of time until Satan came to Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, and said, did God really say? Did God really say? God gave Adam and Eve a command, a command saying, hey, you can eat of anything, but just don't eat of the fruit that's coming from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Just don't do that. And you'll be good. I've given you command to do what you should do. I've given you command to not to do what I'm telling you not to do. And I want you to stay focused. Focused on what you should be doing. But Satan came with deceit, with distraction, saying to Adam and Eve, did God really say? Was it really God's purpose? that you would do this? In fact, I want to tell you that God doesn't have what is best for you in His mind. God doesn't really love you. God doesn't really care for you. He doesn't really want what is best for you. In fact, He is withholding this thing from you because He knows that the day you eat of this, you will be like Him. And He doesn't want to lose His authority over you. So He's keeping you under His thumb. And with this voice of distraction, Adam and Eve weren't so sure anymore. They weren't so sure about the goodness and the mercy of God and the love of God upon their lives and given to things that which they need. As a result, they sinned. They walked away from God. And their sin has severe consequences, does it not? The consequence which did not just affect themselves, but the consequence which affected all of us who are now after them. So what happened in the story of Scripture? Where it turns out that Adam and Eve were distracted, they sinned against God. The consequences are there. But there was one person that was not distracted, who was never distracted, who was all about his Father's will, and that was Jesus. Jesus said in John chapter 6, verse 38, I have come down from heaven not to do what? Not to do my own will, not to be distracted 
about what I could be doing, but to completely focus on the will of Him who sent me. He is completely focused on the will of the Father, and the will of the Father is that Jesus would go to the cross, die on the cross, and by dying on the cross, He would give His perfect righteous life to you and to me and pick up the sins which we have and place upon Himself and be enduring the wrath of God for our sins. And He, after that, died and rose again from the dead to show that this transaction is done, that He has paid for our sins, that He's bringing us back to God, all who believe unto Him. Salvation is completed in Jesus Christ because Jesus stayed focused upon God's will. And today, if we believe upon God, if we call God our Savior, if we call God our Lord, the goal that we have is the same goal of Jesus Christ, which is that we would also not to do our own will, but to do the will of the Father. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says that we're not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. There are many things going on in this world, right? There's things of this world that's telling you to conform your life to, and Paul says don't conform your life to any of those things of this world, the ideologies of this world, the, the draws of this world, the desires of this world. Don't conform your life to those things. Instead, conform your life to God, to His will. But you must first discern that. Discern what is good and acceptable and perfect. So we must be focused. In this passage, in Matthew chapter 10, verse 5 through 15, Jesus is teaching the disciples to be focused. How do you be focused? How do you be focused? Disciples are those who are just newbies. They're, they're wet behind the ears. They're, they're looking at Jesus and they're seeing the ministry of Jesus so broad and so powerful and they're just stepping into it. And they're wondering, can I really do this? Can I really serve as Jesus did? And, and Jesus is not the type of teacher where he is just doing things and just, hey, I'm just dropping nuggets. I hope you pick it up because, you know, like I, 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 you pick up whatever you can pick up. No, Jesus actually did what he did and he specifically, with his words, instruct them on how they can also do as he does. There are four, four focuses which you can see here. Number one, you must have a focused task. If you want to be successful in serving the Lord, you must have a focused task. Verse 5 says, These twelve Jesus sent out, instructing them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now as we come to this passage, we're realizing this is in the context of everything Jesus had been teaching and had been doing. Jesus had been teaching the kingdom of God. He's been teaching them how they may enter into that kingdom. You must be poor in spirit. You must mourn over your sins. You must be meek. You must hunger and thirst after righteousness. And you must claim Jesus as your Lord and Savior because He is the one who fulfilled the law of God for us. He is the Savior. He is the one that we're to look to. But as we also discovered in Matthew chapter 9, verse 38, is that Jesus is doing the ministry alone. So he's calling out for help. He said in verse 38, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. So pray for the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the field. He's not doing this alone. He's not going to do this alone. He wants more people to come and help him. And so this prayer was answered. He prayed throughout the night in Luke chapter 6, verse 12. In the morning, he called the disciples, and we discover who the disciples are. It was Peter, Andrew, James, and John. There was Philip, Bartholomew. There is Thomas and uh, Matthew, the tax collector. There's James, the son of Alphaeus. There's Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot. And lastly, there was Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These are the 12 disciples. And these 12 disciples are called by God to do exactly 
what Jesus is doing to reproduce what Jesus is doing. Jesus is calling people to come and believe unto him, to come into the kingdom of God with a right heart attitude, and these disciples are to do the same. The first instruction is this. We read this already in verse 5 to 6. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And you read this, it's like, what in the world is this about? Like, we couldn't go to some people, but we could go to other people? Like, like, why is Jesus saying this? I know that this might sound confusing for us, but the key is this. There is a specific timeline of God's salvation. And God is telling the disciples that I want you to obey this timeline. I want you to perform this task well in this area, in this time, in this location, so that God's work can progress throughout the world, throughout the world in a way that is how he planned. Specifically is this, is that the Jews are to hear the gospel first. That was God's plan. God's plan is that the Jews are to receive the Messiah first because God ultimately had promised the Messiah to the Jews. You think about the new covenant in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31, where Jeremiah says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. This is a new covenant. This is a covenant which we are saying this is our covenant, right? Right? In Matthew chapter 26, Jesus said, this is the new covenant in my blood. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul said, Jesus said, this is the new covenant in my blood. And we're we're taking communion. We're, We're under the new covenant. All of us are. But we have to remember this new covenant in Jeremiah chapter 31 wasn't given to the Gentiles. In fact, we see that it's given to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And the only reason why it overflowed to the Gentiles is because Jews rejected it. Jews didn't want salvation. So God said, I'm going to come to you with a new covenant. I'm going to come to you giving you the good news of Jesus Christ. I'm going to come to you giving the good news of salvation through the Messiah. But they rejected the Messiah. We saw this in Matthew chapter 23, verse 37, where Jesus, at the end of his ministry, prior to going to the cross, said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would have gathered your children together as hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. I want to gather you. I want to bring to you, uh, bring to you salvation. I gather you under my arms, but you will not willing to come. So what ended up happening is that the gospel now goes to the Gentiles. And this is the promise of Jesus to all his disciples in Matthew chapter 20, verse 19. Now, he said, go therefore and make disciples of who? Not just the Jews, but of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The Gentiles are to go out. Now, everybody is to go out. Jews, those who believe, Gentiles, those who believe, are to go out to all nations and bring the gospel to all nations, and this is where we're at today. And what God's going to do is that eventually He will come back for the Jews when the fullness of the Gentiles come in. Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 11, verse 25 to 27, saying, let you be wise in your own eyes, let you become prideful, thinking, oh, like, like, we're the ones who made a better decision. I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, Paul says. A partial hardening, this is all part of God's sovereignty, right? A partial hardening had come upon Israel until the fullness of Gentile had come in. God said, this is my plan. My plan is that Israel is going to be hardened until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. That all the Gentiles are to be saved under the church age, come in, and then when that happens, he said in verse 26, then all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion, he will banish ungodliness from Jacob, and this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sin. So God doesn't come for the Jews again in saving them. We know how this is going to happen. When we read the book of Zechariah and Revelation, God's going to come again for the Jewish nation. He's going to save them after the tribulation. So we see this. This is the timeline that God has given to the world in a matter of process of salvation, but for the disciples at this moment. In the beginning of this timeline, what they're doing is that they're obeying Christ in preaching the gospel to the Jews first. 
Now, this may not affect you, affect me in terms of what Jesus is saying, because again, this is something that happened in the past. We're following Matthew chapter 28 right now, in which we're preaching the gospel to all nations. But there's a principle we can gather. And the principle is this, is that Jesus was very, very focused. He was focused in Israel. He didn't go anywhere outside of Israel. He was focused on the Jews. He was focused on going to the cross. He knew what exactly what the Father had told him to do. And I wonder if you and I are focused in the same way. Focused in our ministry. Focused in what God's called us to do individually because you can't be everywhere. People sometimes try to do everything. I've seen people in ministry, one day they're over here, one day they're over there, one day they're over there in that event, one day they're over here in this event, and they don't know where they're gonna, what they're going to do any of the day. They just do whatever other people are doing, and they're drawn to different locations. But I want to ask you, is that the most profitable thing for our time? Profitable way to spend our time for the Lord? I believe that each one of us, being as limited as we are, we must be limited in our time. We must be limited in our ability. We have to be focused in doing what we're called to do. And that is why I appreciate the core team who is here. I think that's the reason why Jesus called the disciples, 12 of them, and said, hey, I want you to be focused. Everybody's running out everywhere. That guy's following that teacher. That guy's following that teacher. That guy's doing that thing. That guy's doing that thing. But I want you to be focused on the very specific work. And the very specific work, I believe, for us here is right here the First Baptist Church of Hollywood, is that you are focused on the people who are here. You're focused on the ministry that is happening here. You're focused on your role that is happening or a specific slice of a ministry that is happening here, and you want to do that well. You know, I think about my, my time over here. Like, I, as a pastor, I could do many things, right? I could be debating people on social media. <laughs> what a waste of time. I could be out there preaching other places, preaching at retreats, preaching at different places, maybe perhaps people invite me to, and I say no, because I want to be here. There's no place I want to be rather than preach here on a Sunday morning. I want to preach at least 48 to 50 times a year. Well, actually, more than that, because I actually preach more than twice, uh, preach twice uh, a week, so 90 times a year, something like that. I want to preach I mean, as many times as possible here in this pulpit. And the reason why that is the case is because God has called me here. And there's a focus and a driven desire. Not only do I preach here, I also want to preach from the Word of God, not my opinion. I don't want to just have opinion floating around everywhere. I want to be focused on the Word of God, especially from the New Testament, especially verse from verse to verse, and just learning that, learning and growing myself and not skipping anything, making sure that my heart is being is being. Uh, it, it, it's, it's been guided by the Word of God, and I want that to overflow to the rest of the congregation. See, this is the lesson that God is teaching the disciples. Disciples could be doing many things. They could be out there doing many ministries that are totally unrelated, but Jesus says, no, focus on one thing and do it well. Do it well. Paul had the same idea. In Romans chapter 15, verse 20 to 21, he said, I'm an apostle. An apostle. So what I'm going to do is fulfill my calling as an apostle. He's not going to stick around in one location. I'm not saying it's bad to stick around or not stick around. He's actually one that's preaching everywhere because, again, that's what apostles do, right? He said, I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ had already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation, but as it is written, those who had never been told of him will see, and those who had never heard will understand. He said, I have to fulfill my role as an apostle. So when I preach the gospel, when I plant the church, I have to keep moving on, I have to keep moving on, I have to keep moving on. But he's very, very specific on what he's doing. So the question is, what are you doing? What are we doing? What am I doing? Are we being very specific in our service unto the Lord? Are you following God's calling? Are you seeking to do one thing well? One thing well. If you could just do one thing well, you're ahead of many people, a professor of mine used to say. Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 through 8, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. He means that I fought the good fight. I know my enemy. I know the time I have. I know the arena. I fought the good fight. I've actually engaged with that person, I boxed him. I know the rounds. I know when it begins. I know when it ends. I, I run the race. I know my track. 
I'm not running outside the track. I'm not jumping to different races. I know a particular race I'm supposed to run. I've completed them. So Paul is focused, and Jesus is telling the disciples to be focused as well. So number one, to be a mature believer in Christ, in your service unto the Lord, be focused. Be focused on the task. Whatever task God's called you to do, whatever role God's given to you here in our church, do it well. Do it well. If God's called you somewhere else, do that well for the glory of God. Number two, not just a focused task, focused message. A focused message. Verse 7 through 8, Jesus said, And proclaim as you go, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So be focused in where you go, who you talk to, and be focused in the very message which you proclaim, which is the gospel. Tell people about the kingdom of God. Tell people about this kingdom which there's going to be peace and joy, no more sin, no more sadness, no more pain. This kingdom which Jesus will bring. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 through 7 says, Unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. A child is born. He's going to be king. He's going to be prince of peace and government will be upon his shoulders. His kingdom will have no end. We're to tell people about this reality. The world which we're seeing today will not be the world forever because Christ is coming again to bring forth his righteousness. His rule, his justice, and sin will be dealt away with. So don't you want to enter into this kingdom? And the only way that anyone can enter into that kingdom is through believing onto Jesus as Lord and Savior. And that's why Jesus preached in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3 to verse 6. You must be poor in spirit. You must mourn over your sins. You must be meek. You must hunger and thirst after righteousness, you must believe unto him as your Savior because he came to fulfill the law of God for you. You must believe unto Jesus Christ. So you have a central message, but you also have activities in life, in your service that surround that message. You can see this in verse 8. As they preach the message, saying the kingdom of God is at hand, there too also Number uh, verse 8, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, and cast out demons. They're to do these activities that would demonstrate the kingdom. Now, you have to ask the question, why did Jesus choose these activities, right? Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons, in proclaiming that he is the king. I mean, he could do all kinds of other things. He could, like, jump over really tall buildings. He could fly around, right? Like, I'm going to fly around for a while. You can see that I'm king. I'm the Messiah. I'm God. Who else could do this, right? I'm going to jump real high around in tall buildings and, and jump down. I won't be hurt. That's what Satan tried to tempt Jesus with. Like, show everybody that you are the son of God. We jump down from this building. You won't get hurt. But Jesus didn't choose any of those ways to manifest the kingdom. And the reason why is because Jesus wants to demonstrate the kingdom through the reversal of the curse to a level right? The curse is reversed when the sick are healed. The curse is reversed when the dead are raised. The curse is reversed when the lepers are cleansed. The curse are reversed when demons are cast out. So it's all about reversing the curse. When you are bringing the kingdom, you are reversing the curse. The curse no longer is there because the curse is undone. The curse in Genesis chapter 3 has been dispelled, undone when the Messiah comes. He's going to come and crush the head of the serpent and that's it. So Jesus coming to reverse the curse, and he did so in demonstration of the kingdom. To the lepers, or one leper in Matthew chapter 8, verse 3, he said, I will be clean, and the leper was cleansed. To the centurion's servant, he said, go, let it be done as you believe. Then the centurion's servant was healed. To the demoniac in chapter 8, verse 32, Jesus said, go, and the demons had to leave. And Matthew chapter 9, verse 6, the paralytic, Jesus said, rise up, take your bed, and go home. And he went home in Matthew chapter 9, verse 22. He said to the woman with blood loss, go, your faith has made you well. And she was well. And in Matthew chapter 9, verse 25, 
It was Jairus' daughter. He went in and took her by the hand, and the girl arose. She was risen from the dead. So Jesus had demonstrated the kingdom in visible ways by reversing the curse, and he's encouraging the disciples to do so, saying, I'm giving you power to do so, and you can do the same in demonstration of the authenticity of the kingdom which I am to bring. Now, for us, I don't know if we could do that. I mean, you may, but the consistency with Jesus doing it is unparalleled. Healing the sick, casting out demons, raising the dead in demonstration of the kingdom. This may not be for our time. Okay, we are not given that gift. But what I believe what God is calling us to do is a different way which we can actually manifest the kingdom, meaning that we can actually show people what the kingdom of God is like by helping people with things that are physical in nature, whether it be giving people some clothes, giving people some shoes, giving them some food, giving them some water to demonstrate that there is a reversal of the kingdom, a reversal of the curse in our interaction with them. And I think that's helpful because oftentimes people come around this church, and this is many years ago, people came to me and said, you know, I never knew this church was open. I was driven by this place multiple times. The doors are always closed. Some people come to me and say, you know, I thought this church is a prop. I thought it was a Hollywood prop and that people just do movies here and that's it. And the reason why that's the case is because, yes, I can preach the gospel message here, but unless we go out the doors and show people love, show people some concern and care, Nobody's going to believe what I preach over here. So Jesus said to his disciples, actually go do some work so that they can actually see the kingdom of God being displayed in and through you. I think about Thursday, right? Not just Thursday, but Wednesday. We go out there, we pass out, we pass out uh, clothing, and we show forth smile. But last two Thursdays ago, what we were doing is that we were doing party on the porch, and that was an extremely encouraging time for us as a church and for people who are walking by. We were able to minister to people, passing out candy, having smiles, uh, uh, showing people we love them and we welcome them. All these activities which we do demonstrates the kingdom of God that there is a reversal of the curse, right? Instead of hatred, instead of anger, instead instead of fear, what we have is welcoming attitude, what we have is love, what we have is trust. All these are Activities which you do indeed reverses the curse. Does it take sacrifice from us? Of course it does. But it demonstrates the kingdom of God clearly. Clearly. So we need to have both. Both the message itself and what we do, the activities that will actually support the message, authenticate the message. But the message itself is of most importance. If you were to choose one or the other, you shouldn't have to choose, but if you were to choose one over the other, saying this one is more important, it's always important. The message. Jesus even said this in Matthew chapter 26, verse 11. He said to, really to Judas, but to everybody, Judas was complaining, saying, why was this flask broken and poured upon Jesus? Should have been sold for 300 denarii given to the poor. Jesus said in verse 11, for you always have the poor with you, but you will not always have me. Jesus said, yeah, you could do all that. Go ahead and do all that, but this time is important because this time is for me. The message is always most important. I mean, today you can see all kinds of organizations out there, whether it be American Red Cross or whether it be Salvation Army. They had Christian origins, Christian theology in the development of these organizations. Now you don't see any of that anymore because they have shifted to some kind of humanitarian aid instead of keeping on the message of Christ, and they lost it all. I'm not saying what they do is bad. They do is good. They should do that and still proclaim Christ. But again, they lost it. I think there's both to it, right? Jesus said, go proclaim the kingdom of God. Tell people how they may be saved, but also be a part of their their lives in a way that which they can visibly see the kingdom of God being displayed through you, through you. So we see here, we see here there is a focused message, focused message, a focused task. Third, focused provision. Focused provision. Verse 8, Jesus said, You received without paying, so give without pay. Interesting. Jesus is saying, hey, the ability that you have to serve, you're going to be wonderfully praised, wonderfully looked up to because of how many people can heal the sick, how many people can cast out demons, how many people can raise the dead. You are not going to see too many people can do this, but you are able to do it, so you're going to draw a lot of people around you 
And I'm saying that you should never ever think so highly about yourself that you think of yourself better than other people. You have received all your gifts without pay. It's like what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, which he said, What do you have that you did not receive? And if you received it, why do you boast as you did not receive it? The Corinthian church were boasting to each other, saying, Well, I do this, and I do that, and I speak in tongues, and I spoke in prophecy, and I, I was doing this important activity, and I was giving so much to the church, and, 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 and they were boasting against each other. And Paul said, Why do you boast? Like, isn't your ability to give already a gift from God like you couldn't even do what you do unless God had given you the ability to do so so that's not something you should boast of because everything you have is from God anyways and so if that's the case Jesus said in verse 8 then give without pay serve people without pay serve people not wanting anything back you don't have to give me any money you don't have to give me any influence you don't have to give me any kind of notoriety I, I just serve you because again what I have isn't mine anyway so I give to you without asking for anything in return in fact Jesus said this is the proper attitude you should have as a servant of God in Luke chapter 17 verse 10 Jesus said if you our servant of God, you should say, we are simply unworthy servants. We've only done what was in our duty. It's just my duty to do so. Don't think more highly of me. It's just It's really what I should be do, doing anyways. Paul said, woe is me, right, if I don't preach the gospel. Woe is me. Like, I don't get extra credit for this. Like, I'm under obligation to do what God's called me to do. So Jesus says, hey, go with the right heart. You don't have to get anything out of ministry. Receive or receive what you receive is without pay. So give without pay. Give without thinking what you're going to get in return. This is the right heart. Ministry by itself is a joy. You don't have to be paid for it. You don't have to get influence. You don't have to get notoriety. You don't have people pay attention to you. By itself is a joy. Serve with the right heart. If you serve with the right heart, you know that you're serving unto the Lord, right? If God sees then that's enough. I don't need anyone else to see. I just want God to see. If God sees, then God is going to provide. This is when it comes to verse 9, where Jesus said, acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belt. Acquire no gold. Gold is extravagant wealth. Silver is medium wealth. Copper is modest wealth. Don't then bring anything with you in your belt. Just go, trusting God's going to provide. Verse 10, no bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or staff for the laborer deserve his food. You don't have to bring two bags or you don't have to bring a bag. You don't have to bring two clothing. You don't have to bring two sandals. You don't have to bring a staff. Staff is a symbol of protection, also of support. Don't bring it with you. Again, this is a principle. I'm not saying that like when you go out to the mission field, when you bring your kids and your family and you're in the jungle, so you don't bring anything. I, I, I don't think that's what Jesus is saying. But what Jesus is saying is that when you go, you're not thinking about like, I'm gonna, I got to provide for myself or somehow I'm going to make it work all by myself or I got to plan out so detail-wise in case anything happens. Jesus says, just go. If God calls you to go, he will sustain. He will support because the laborer deserves his food. God will sustain the ministry. Ministry is not for what you can get out of it. Ministry is something which you can give, and then God will support you just enough to continue on. He may give you more, but again, God will give you what he will give you just so that you can continue on. I think of the right heart attitude, right heart attitude is that of Peter and John, and that is opposite of what we see in Acts chapter 8, verse 18 and 19, in their confrontation of Simon the magician. See, so many people go into ministry for what they can get out of it, right? Because ministry is a popular thing. It's like, you know what, if I could just grow a big church, then everybody will pay attention to me, then people will come to me, they will ask me to sign books, I will write books, and ask me to sign books, people will praise me for the, 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 the amount of influence I have, and people will give to me, whatever. And so many people enter into ministry for what they can get out of it because they want to be the hero of a story. And that's what happened to Simon the Magician. Simon the Magician saw James, actually saw John and Peter and Philip ministering Samaria and saw the miracles, saw the signs, saw that they would lay hands on people and they would receive the Holy Spirit. And what he did is this, in verse 18 and 19, he offered them money saying, give me this power also so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive 
the Holy Spirit. I want this power. Simon the magician already is very popular. I mean, he was popular in Samaria, but he saw what uh, John and Peter was doing and saw what Philip was doing. He said, well, this is even more powerful than what I was doing. I mean, I mean, more significant, I believe. So if I can just have this power, if I can have this ability, then I can draw even more disciples after me. So he offered them money thinking that I can just make this money back. I could just have more money if people would just follow me. So he's trying to get what he can get out of ministry. But, Jesus, but Peter said to him in Acts chapter 8, verse 20, May your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. Your silver perish with you. The gift of God is free. You're supposed to give freely. You're supposed to serve the Lord and let God work through you. And by that, that's the joy in itself. There's nothing else that you're to get out of it besides that. We're to seek the Lord. Simon the magician didn't have this, so therefore he was rebuked. And I think some evidence presented that he actually repented. But again, this is an evidence of a man who was not serving God with a heart attitude that is right. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, this is what you need to have. You need to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Seek first the kingdom of God. Do his will. Be faithful. And God will add things to you. It doesn't mean that you can't take wages. It doesn't mean that you can't be employed for ministry. It doesn't mean that you can't accept gifts from people because they appreciate what you're doing. But you never, ever ask for these things. God can provide to you, but your heart is that you will seek after the kingdom of God and his righteousness. In fact, all that we want is to serve the Lord. Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 8, if we have food, if we have clothing, we will be content with these. Just food and clothing, just the ability to keep going and go, going and going and going. If we could just keep doing what we're doing, ministry itself is its greatest reward. So you see, there's a third heart attitude which Jesus wanted the disciples to have. A focused message, a focused task, a focused provision, and lastly, lastly, a focused people. A focused people. This is an important point. In verse 11 to verse 15, we see three types of people that disciples will encounter. First type, the people who receive them. Verse 11, whatever town or village that you enter, find out who is worthy in it and stay there until you depart. So you walk in the village and you preach the gospel kind of like a street preacher and See who's watching. You're reading people, saying, okay, are you interested? There's some people who are interested. Some people are just like, I don't want anything to do with that guy. So you go with the guy who are interested. Don't try to convince guys that are not interested. This is Hollywood, right? We experience that. Like, guys who walk in, guys who walk out, they, they hear something, they go back out. That's okay. That's okay. But there are guys who, or women who are here, and they hear the whole message, and they want to talk about it some more. These are the people we minister to. We don't chase people. We just don't chase people. Jesus never chased people. He sets up the requirement. And he says, live up to this or go somewhere else, right? Come and follow me or go somewhere else. Come and take up your cross and follow me or go somewhere else. He never, ever chases people. I mean, he loves people. I love people too. I text people, hey, how are you? I haven't been seeing, haven't heard from you for a while. That's, that's a couple of seconds. I do so but because I think about them, pray for them, but I don't chase them. Because I know that whoever God will bring here is whoever God will bring here. This is ministry thought activity. It's like you don't have to try to convince people by your own human efforts. It just doesn't work. It never works. And Jesus says, don't even try. Whoever receives you, go and stay there. These are your friends. These are the people that will stay with you. Go with them. But, oh, and chapter verse 12, Jesus continues on. If you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. If you preach the gospel, people who are hearing the gospel and they want the gospel and you stay with them, the peace of the gospel will be upon them. They will be those who receive the gospel. They will be saved. 
So this is the first group. The first group are the people who actually receive the gospel. The second group is the hardest one. Verse 13 to 14, but if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. So this is actually a group which initially accepts you, but later on rejects you. Say, so receive you and say, look, and come to my house, we'll hear you. But then later on, it turned out to be not worthy. And Jesus says, then take off and go. Let the peace return to you. And this is what we experience in Hollywood as well. You've been here in ministry long enough, you know that you build relationship with people. Seems to be your best friend people who are ministering with, and within a year later, because some reason or the other, they're gone, and now you're hurt, and I'm hurt, right? It's like, well, like, what do we do? Do we just, like, forget about it? No, we don't forget about it, but we have to let these guys go, and we have to continue our ministry. They're not worthy. They're not. They're, let, the, let the peace which you give to them return to us. That's it. I, I'm not going to judge them, right? Jesus later on said in verse 15, you don't have to be the judge. Let God be the judge. But again, we have a hard attitude in which we're just, Focus on God. Focus on who wants to hear. And those who don't, they're just not going to hear. And those who leave after a time of friendship, well, we let them leave. But if they're with us, they're with us. If not, God will lead them somewhere else. That's okay. Verse 14, the third group is that those who don't receive you at all. Verse 14, if anyone who will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town in verse 15, truly I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. They're the third group of people. They don't even want anything to do with you. And Jesus said, just, just go. Just go. Let God bring about what he will bring about. They don't want to listen to you. Well, there's judgment. There's judgment. Now, this is a ministry philosophy that is helpful for us. Now, we're not to judge people. And again, this is talking about salvation, but we're talking about First Baptist Church of Hollywood, and we can't read hearts, but what we know is this, is that there are going to be people who are drawn to us, and there are going to be people who are not drawn to us, and there are going to be people who are drawn to us initially, but then are not drawn to us today. And sometimes we feel hurt by that, and we no longer want to reach out anymore. We say, well, what's the point? I reached out before, and now I have to build new relationships, and I have to build new, uh, new, new friendships, and is, is it right for me to feel that way? The answer is yes. Just build new friendships. Build new relationships. Because that's what Jesus is saying. Read people. Understand where people are at because God's going to bring different people to you and you don't have to be hurt by the relationships that leave. Just shake off the dust of your feet and go and let God take care of the rest. I think about this Wednesday. This is exactly what was happening. Wednesday is where I get a lot of my illustrations from. But again, this is Ministry here and ministry outside is all the same. This is how we together as a core team, if you consider yourself to be part of the core team of the First Baptist Church Hollywood and you want to keep some kind of sanity in your ministry because so many people walk in and out, there's so many transitory people trying to keep some sanity and trying to keep up with the people and love people, we need to follow this exactly or are we going to lose our minds. I think about Wednesday, right? Wednesday, um, this is what happened on Boulevard and uh, we were out there. And uh, one of the guys from Sherwood Global, which is a ministry team, that were out there, and he was street preaching. So I said, oh, that's great. We could street preach, and I would pass out tracks while you street preach. And it was a wonderful time. He wasn't loud at all. But there's a guy next to us, and was on Highland and, and, and Hollywood in that area. He was mad. He was angry. And, and after the guy street preached for about five minutes, he came to us and pushed the guy and said, I don't want to hear about this. I don't want to hear you talking about me. It's funny, right? It's like, we weren't even talking about you. Honestly, like, we didn't even know you. But it's, I don't want to hear you talking about me. He pushed, he pushed me too because tried, he tried to throw away some of the stuff and say, hey, you can't be throwing that away. He pushed me. This is on Hollywood Boulevard. And we had a decision to make. And the decision was, do we stay? Do we try to have this confrontation? Because people were gathered around already. And they were watching us. They were thinking, you know, what's going on? Initially, they're watching us because they want to hear the gospel. Now they're watching us because they, they're seeing a fight breaking out, you know? And so this guy's pushing us, right? And we're talking to the guy, the show world global guy. He's like, do you want to stay? Do you want to leave? He's like, we're going to leave. We're going to leave. We're going to just shake off the dust of our feet. And we're going to leave. Because why? Because it's not the time. You know, if we have this confrontation, we say, oh, it's right for us to be here. We have the right to be here on the public sidewalk. Then we get in a fight. And all of a sudden, the gospel message is lost. You know, we, we don't hear the gospel anymore. Instead, we just hear or see this confrontation. So we left at that moment. 
But you know what? We came back. <laughs> we came back later, and we preached the gospel in another location. And a guy actually came and said he's sorry. You know, so the guy just needed to calm down for a second. He needed to calm down for a second. And by shaking off the dust of your feet and leaving that alone for a second and allowing for God's Holy Spirit to work, maybe people actually come back. So we're not hurt about it. We're not worried about it. We're just doing what God's called us to do and let people who will come come to us. I think this is what Jesus is talking about when he said in John chapter 6, verse 37. And this is talking about salvation. He said, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. He also said in John chapter 6, verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So he knows very clearly, he's just, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. I'm going to be faithful to minister to the people whom God has already touched, all right? In Romans chapter 8, verse 30, there are already those who have been predestined. There are already those who have been called. There are those who have been justified. There are those who have been glorified. There are those who God has already elected. And our role here in our church is to minister to those whom God has already touched. And so we're just simply focused on that and working with that. We're not the source of salvation for people, but we must be open to be used by God in all circumstances to build new relationships for Christ. So this is what it means to serve here. And I think this is a, a, a tremendous important passage for us to understand if we want to have a sustained ministry in Hollywood. This is not a suburban ministry. This is not a ministry where you're going to see a lot of the same people. We're going to see people who are transi transitioning in and out all the time. And how do you handle that in your heart? You know, for a long time when I come here, I was thinking, you know, I'm going to, by God's grace, I'll grow this church I mean, more of people who are here. And I figure maybe that's not God's will. Maybe it's not God's will that a lot of people come here. I was talking to people, I was talking to Lucino. Maybe it's God's will that we become a place where people transit in and out and feel blessed by the ministry that is here. And maybe that's our role. Maybe that's what we've been doing all this time. And if we're just looking to do something else while well, God is saying, I have this for you. And we're trying to do something else, and we miss out the blessings of being what God's called us to be, who God's called us to be. Maybe we're supposed to be a place where people are transitioning in and out and hearing the gospel and take it somewhere else. The kingdom of God is not here only. The kingdom of God is not the first Baptist church in Hollywood. The kingdom of God is much broader than that. And my goal and our goal shouldn't just to be proliferating this particular slice of the kingdom. Our goal is to proliferate the entirety of God's kingdom by allowing people to come in and out and be blessed by this place. And I think that's a good, healthy attitude for our ministry here for this time being because that's what we're doing. We have a small core team, and we have a lot of people transitioning in and out. So let that be and enjoy that and do well in that. And if we do so, though, one ask you is this, is that there must be a core team. There must be a small core team, if not, if not a bigger core team, at least a small one because even Jesus had a core team. He had a core team. He had his 12 disciples. And so I ask that if you would consider yourself to consider this a home church and make this church your home in the sense that you're part of this team so that you can serve God and the people who come through in the way which I just mentioned, letting them feel blessed when they transit in and when they transit out. Maybe this is what God's called us to do. I mean, I'm not sure if God will grow us. God can grow us. But at least right now, I believe that we can do that well for the glory of God. Again, I mentioned to you that my seminary professor once said, most people try to do many things in life. They don't do anything well. But if you just focus on doing one thing and that one thing well, you would be ahead of many people in life. Just focus on one thing and one thing you do well. What's the one thing you can serve in? We're not even talking about ministry. We may be just talking about a slice of a ministry. Do that one thing well for the glory of God so that people can benefit from what you do and how you serve them. And your life can be an example to others to follow, for others to follow as they do their one thing well as well. And in that way, we can all grow together for the glory of God. Let's pray. Father, we want to lift our hearts, our thoughts to you, and we want to submit to you because this is not our kingdom. This is your kingdom. And as Paul said, that if we 
work hard and do not be discouraged. In due season, we will reap. And we want to reap, but we want to reap in your ways, Lord, not in our ways, not in our own thoughts, not in our own vision, but your ways. And so thank you, Lord, for allowing us to serve here. We pray for every single soul that comes in and out of the First Baptist Church of Hollywood will see this place as a place where they experience tremendous blessings in Christ Jesus. We thank you, Lord, that we are called the core team who are called here are to serve you for the time that they're here. And that may you bring them joy, peace, and patience, endurance as they serve because we all need each other in Christ Jesus. We thank you for the encouragement we have. Lord, just continue to encourage us as we serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.